so I, I'm sort of following the theme of a couple of talks this morning that say something about specific uses of software. Um, and, uh, uh, in, in, and I'm sort of pleased to do so. One of the rules that you learn about giving talks is that there are three things that you want to do. You should certainly have three steps. Step one is you tell them what you're going to tell them. Step two is you tell them. And step three is you tell them what you told them. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to break that rule. Absolutely. <laughs> Relatively. Absolutely. Okay. So why do I think I break relatively absolutely? Because I'm going to have a fourth step. It's going to be tell them what you're not going to tell them. <laughs> then repeat what you told them. So what I'm not going to tell you is that, look, you can do latex animations. Because that's really pretty well known. In fact, if you were at the Boston meeting two years ago, Jim Heffron and I gave a talk. That was the one with the Death Star in it, if you remember. <laughs> Uh, that was great. And in, in the middle of that, there was a, an animation that ran. So th this is well-known stuff. Uh, but the, so now I move to the next step, telling you what I am going to tell you. And that is that not only can you create animations, but there's this whole range of methods of doing it, from the very simple, to where everything is kind of automated, to ones where you get to the uh, other extreme, where you put in all the details yourself. And they all work in a kind of uh, magical way together. You can intermix these things. So as, as I kind of develop these things, I thought this is really interesting that you're basically using this tech overview. And you have all these different ways to feed these things in to get these animations of output. So, so that's, what I, that's why I'm here. So now I've, I've completed step one. I've, I've told you what I'm going to tell you. OK, now we move on. Uh, Okay, we try to move on. Yes, we do move on. Okay, so so here's a, the, what I'm going to do is give you the pattern we're going to follow up from here. So uh, we're going to go through a series of three-step procedures. And the three steps are <coughs> the following. The first thing I'm going to do is present you something mathematical. I, I can't help it. You know? <laughs> and you know math professors. So, so there'll be some mathematical figure. And the second step is I'm going to say, well, we can amplify this in some way or other with animations. I'll say here's an, something that I consider interesting. And then the third step will be sort of how, how you did it and how you put the pieces together. And, and we'll go through these with different examples. So, uh, so this is sort of giving the paradigm. Uh, so for example, this is sort of a, a picture. Um, actually, um, a lot of these come from first year linear algebra course that I've been teaching in the last couple of years. And uh, this came from the fact that these famous formulas on the bottom line for the sums of uh, sines of, and cosines of sums of angles. Uh, I mentioned that in class and I will look at these glazed eyes. And <laughs> if you guys, you know, and if you three guys in the back think you saw glazed eyes this morning, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> so, so, you know, I realize I have to say something here. So, so I, I went home and thought, what, well, what do they actually know? And the answer is, they know the Pythagorean theorem. You can use that. And the other thing they know is something that says, like, sine equals opposite over hypotenuse or cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So I say, okay. So, 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 so. Oh, woo. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Um, <laughs> Come to my class. <laughs> um, so the so um, so I thought, well, how am I going to show this um, with nothing else but that? So this was a figure I came up with. It's it's not very complicated. I'm sure someone's done it before. But um, the uh, the point is uh, the uh, is the construction of the figure. So you have your two um, angles alpha and beta, and we stick it inside a unit circle, circle of radius one here. Um, and uh, so that gives us the, the, the A, B, and 0, 1 points. And you drop a perpendicular from the top to get the point F. And you drop a perpendicular to this 0, A line and continue it through the X axis. And that makes your triangle, the yellow triangle. Um, now, uh, if 
you want to compute the area of a triangle, uh, I really feel safe with this one, right? So we're going to do height times base divided by 2. And if you look at this picture, you have a height here, which actually is sine alpha plus beta. You have a, a height here and you have a base here. But you also, if you turn your head to the side, you have a height here and a base here. So you compute the area twice and put them together and that's the end. Okay? So that's my technique. Um, but then, of course, when you, when you use a technique like that, you uh, have to worry about the extreme cases. Okay? So, so uh, I try to add an extra little lesson here with extreme cases. So I'll show you what I mean by this. So here's our picture. And I tell them, that, remember the angle beta was up here. What happens if beta gets small? So when we, are we actually, yeah, we're doing that. So when beta gets small, the picture changes in some significant or perhaps significant way, right? That D that was less than 1 is roamed to the outside, and maybe your proof has crashed. On the other hand, the, we can increase beta like that. So when that happens, the triangle completely changes, and ooh, that doesn't look good at all. So in fact, if you follow it through, the, the first one's OK, the second one's not. So there's a little lesson to be uh, learned from that. So, uh, so that's the graphics. And the third part, I'll always have a frame which goes how it's done. And how it's done will follow this theme. OK, so how are you going to make an animation? So an animation consists of a series of frames, right? So you have to have something that generates the individual frames of your animation. Then you have to have some way to stitch those animations together. And then once you have them stitched together, you have to put them into some format that your uh, software re uh, recognizes. So the, there are two typical kind of formats, as you've seen through this meeting. One is to use PDF. So that means using something like PDF LaTeX. So you have to bring into PDF LaTeX some format it understands, namely JPEG, PNG, uh, PDF. Um, so if you're going that route, you have to somehow stitch that together. The other route that we've seen uh, emerging is using HTML files with the LaTeX stitched in uh, using MapJax, which I think we'll see more of. And in that case, you have different options of bringing in and in different formats. Uh, there are lots available. Um, the one that I typically use are animated GIFs. Uh, animated GIFs is from the GIF 89, so it's 25 years old now. And you're guaranteed that every browser will work. I've never found one that doesn't work with animated GIFs. Some of the other applications you find uh, the, uh, that you'll have some problems. So with this, with doing it in option number three, you're guaranteed to have something that you can that you can use uh, universally. With item number two, with PDF files, you're you stand really good chances of crashing the uh, the PDF reader if you're not using Acrobat reader, for example. So you have to decide what your your purposes are going to be. Okay, so that's the that's the plan as we set things up. So now, uh, here's the first problem that uh, I want to bring out. So this is sometimes called falling ladder problem. And here it is. You have a ladder leaning against the wall. Uh, you pull on the bottom of the ladder so that it goes, goes to the right there. And what happens to the top of the ladder? It falls down. Right, OK, it falls down. So uh, the question is, we look at the midpoint. So this guy here is, oh, there's laser pointing in my hand. Yeah. This point here is the midpoint of the ladder. And as you pull it out, of course, that, that midpoint moves. And the question is, what kind of path does that follow as you start to pull this thing out? And I won't ask you to do the, the computation, but I'm giving you three choices there. So does it sort of look like this? You know, it sort of comes down and then moves over, so that you call the front goes up. Or does it go down in a straight line like that? Or maybe it goes down like that. Right? Kind of, so you're giving three choices. You make your choice. I'm not going to ask you to take a vote. So. <laughs> <laughs> but keep it in mind. OK, so that's the problem. Actually, uh, I'm going to give you the answer. This is the only proof in this talk. <laughs> but, but, but this is so elegant and so breathtaking that I couldn't resist it. So here, here's, here's how the proof works. So here's our ladder, right? Uh, 
and so it's circle. What? Circle. Three. <laughs> this guy gets out my punchline. No. <laughs> I say, say, here's the ladder. He gets out my punchline. <laughs> Forest. So what it says is the bisectors, these bisect each other. L is the length of the ladder. It means the distance from this point to the origin is L over 2, the constant L over 2. And what kind of figure do you get when you, well, I already told you, so I don't have to ask you. If you have a fixed point in you, it's going to be a semi, it's going to be a semicircle, right? Um, something that perhaps we didn't guess. So, um, so, so here we go. So you might not believe that. So maybe I'll make this a little more believable. Okay, set. Yeah, so there we go. Okay, so, so it really does do that. Um, actually, when I was preparing this talk, I suddenly realized something. Um, that uh, this is the ladder falling because you're pulling the thing out, but, but a ladder normally fall, you know, normally just falls over, right? Like that. And, and when the ladder falls over like that, the center makes the same path. Right? It's, it's the same, same semicircle. So uh, that's, that's sort of astonishing, and, and, but true. OK, so uh, if I didn't uh, give you the animation, you probably wouldn't believe it. So, so here's how it's done. And uh, I like this example because I try to force the most fundamental way of doing it. So in other words, if you love assembler program, <laughs> assembler program, you'll love this. If you thought plain tech was the best thing that ever happened in the world, you'll love this, this technique. Uh, if you like doing Pavre from the command line, <laughs> this, this, is, this is for you. So, uh, so I'll tell you what I did. Basically, uh, you know, the picture that you're looking at with this ladder is pretty simple. Um, I mean, all you have is this one line here. You have uh, a wall and maybe a floor, and you just have to draw the line, the center, and the arc, right? So there are only uh, about four elements to draw there. And you can draw that in raw postscript for people who remember the blue book and the gray book and the red book. Yeah. This uh, took me, oh, let me get my mouth back. Took me, I said, 10 lines of code. I actually wrote it down. Oh, 50. Sorry, I must have annotated it. Uh, so, so yeah, you write the basic thing in 15 lines of code um, with one parameter built into it, and that's the height above the wall. And, and then what? Well, then you have to replace that param parameter by um, actual values. And I used <laughs> said for that. Can you, can you imagine that you'd actually use said again? So, uh, so said is actually the perfect tool for that. And that gives you your your frames as postscript files. Uh, you in we have to generate something that we can use. Um, and what a, there's a sort of a, a meta question here. What are we looking at here when I'm giving you these things? Well, you're looking at the screen, and the screen is looking at the projection, and the projection is the output from the computer, and the computer is running the Acrobat reader, which is running a PDF file, right? So you think you're looking at the animation, but you're looking at the, you have this whole stack of stuff on top of it, right? So uh, what it means is ultimately everything that's that I'm doing today is in one single PDF file, and you'd have to patch this all together. Uh, that means that you have to get this into, in this case, PNG format so that you can read it into there. Uh, in principle, you could. There are other ways of stitching it together, but for this case. Uh, uh, for all the for all the convergence I'm doing today, I use the Image Magic Suite, which is available all over, and it's terrific for these things. So, and, and then there's the Animates package. It, 
that you can use with PDF LaTeX that's been there for years. <coughs> then you have things where you say animate graphics. It reads in each individual file and, uh, and creates the graphics, and that's what you looked at. Second step, which I'll come back to, and, and that is if you want to look at this as HTML files, and I can't do it while I'm looking at this, right, because there's a stack of stuff on top of it, uh, then you just change each uh, PS file to a GIF and then patch them together. <laughs> One of a number of tools. I've used Image Magic, but they're GIF sickles uh, sick and another rather number of other things. Okay, so this is sort of another view of the same problem. So I'm going to ask you, um, you had an option of concave down, straight line, concave up this way. How many of you, when they first looked at it, thought concave up? Not hands up. Ah, you're an honest bunch of guys. <laughs> okay, if, if you thought concave up, look at me with the smile. <laughs> Okay, well, yeah, it's really coercive. So, so here's, a, here's another graphic that's sort of at the other end of the extreme, and I'll tell you why. So, so here's what's going on in your mind. Um, so there's the centers going the way we think, but, but this thing, if you look at this area swept out, the, the envelope of this thing, you get this nice line here, which you can compute down in the happy cattle formula. Um, <laughs> can't help it. So and if you look at this area that's swept out, of course you get this, the, the boundary of it in this nice concave, and it's so coercive. I, I mean, you, it, it's got to move along that, but it doesn't. <laughs> so so that's, uh, that's uh, really an interesting lesson that you can get from this. Where does this um, animation come from? Well, uh, well, you can, there's a hint on the bottom there. So um, uh, Rob Beezer in his talk on Monday mentioned Sage. So Sage is an open source symbolic manipulator like Maple or Math, MATLAB or Mathematica. Uh, and it can do all sorts of things. And you can do this in nine lines in Sage. He wants this whole thing and it's nice. So, uh, so that's sort of the other extreme. So if, 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 you're, if you're the poverty command line guy, the first line works really well and you can control every little piece that goes on. But if you like this, that's okay too. Okay, so that's the uh, so uh, that's uh, uh, how that works. Sage puts the whole thing together, and then you read in the pieces into the file. Okay, uh, second example we want to look at is uh, slicing the slicing the cube. So uh, we we call this cube. Um, the, I, I really have to thank the tug people for providing me with a, <laughs> with a deformable. Mud holder that could turn into a cube. So, so here's here's the question. We have a cube. So if I hold it like this, and suppose I just slice it across the midsection. You know, what's the cross section? Well, you have a square, top square on the bottom. The cross is a square, right? Classes. No problem. So I'll make it a little harder. Instead of holding it this way, I'll hold it point up and point down, like that, right? And we'll say, let's slice it across the middle, and what's our cross section? You don't answer. You don't answer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're not supposed to be my slave. Okay? So, so uh, I give you uh, four seconds to think of this. Okay, so you've got the answer. Uh, well, actually, if you think about it, it's really easy because uh, let's take one of these faces. So we cut it right across the middle and we slice it something like here. So, whatever our plane is, it's going to hit this face. When I rotate it, it hits this one, and hits this one. So by the symmetry, it hits the three top. And then I just go, hmm, right? And the plane didn't change. The figure did. So it hit three bottom. What was the three bottom? So it has to hit every face, right? How many faces? Six. What's the figure going to be? It's got to be a hexagon, right? Regular hexagon. So uh, you might not believe that. So here's, here's our... Uh, <laughs> So, uh, everybody convinced with that now? That, uh, <laughs> okay. So, um, so, and so now, how's it done? Yeah, so uh, this was actually done by the generating the image that's going to piece together with asymptote. And the reason I use the asymptote is that it's really strong in 3D images, right? It can do the Death Star, it certainly can do a cube. 
and uh, uh, so uh, its natural output is EPS, encapsulated postscript. So I took the output, converted it to PNG, and just read them in the way you do with the animate package. And there it goes. That's the story. Uh, incidentally, uh, with, um, with asymptote, you can tell it what kind of output file you want. You can go directly to PNG. And what does it do? It takes its output and runs it through image matrix. <laughs> so there you go. OK, so that's the second example. Uh, third example is the following. So this is a matrix. Um, let me just run that animation for you. This is nice. It's got little buttons and things. So, uh, so here we go. So let's watch the matrix change as we go along. Okay, this is the first algorithm we uh, teach to, to our students. So, uh, so we've reached the end result. So now that we've reached the end result, you have these ones that kind of march from upper left to lower right that are done in red. So these are sometimes called pivot, pivot points. Uh, and everything above and below those ones are zeros, and then you have some other stuff left over. Uh, this is called the reduced row echelon form of a matrix. And there's a, an algorithm that, that starts from the beginning, which is there, and gets you to where you want to go. So, for example, if we want to get this one up top, uh, you have to get something that's non-zero in there according to the algorithm. So if you get this three up here, uh, then that would be great. And the uh, algorithm allows you to operate on rows. So, if, so the, if we interchange row one and row two, which I can show with this single step, see row one and row two, then three's up top. If we divide every element in this row by three, which we do with the next single step, then it turns into a one. And if we want to take everything below the one to a zero, you want to change this to a, uh, a zero, you take this row and subtract the first row from it, and it turns into a zero, and same thing with the one below it. And you just carry on step by step, right? These turn into ones, and everything above and below them turn into zeros. So while I'm not describing the process exactly, you get the picture, right? You, these ones go down the diagonal in some way. Right? OK, so the advantage of this is that uh, if you like, you can single step through this thing to see what the story is. Or uh, if you want, you can really uh, you know, sort of zip through, right? And yeah, so it's the forest trees question, right? So, um, so uh, that's uh, I actually use this in class, and uh, and they uh, like that. Now, um, yeah. So where did this go? This was actually the most fun to make um, because uh, uh, of the the method that's used here. So uh, part of the animate package allows you something that's called animate in line. And what animated line does is the following. It's an environment, and within that, you have a sequence of, of frames. They begin frame, end frame, just like that. And you just put them in a row, you know, begin frame, end frame. And when you run the thing, the animate pack st stitches it together, and, and it works, right? So if you can decide what goes between begin frame and end frame, oh, there's nothing to it, right? Uh, well, Sage is, is a, you know, Sage is basically Python with extensions added in. Uh, so, for example, uh, with Sage, it automatically uses rational numbers and mathematicians would use them. It doesn't truncate them the way Python would. Right? And uh, a number of other things. Uh, so, what it means is if, if you're teaching this algorithm, you ought to be able to program it. So, so that's what it is. I program it. So, you give the thing the matrix, and it gives you the LaTeX code for doing this whole animation. So, it's great fun. Um, and, and this is the basic process. OK, so that's that guy. Oh, here's uh, another example. So this is a three-circle problem. So let me run this animation here. Can you see that, see that OK? Ooh, that's fun. Yeah. So, so what's happening here? I guess I ought to tell you a little bit about what's, what's happening. Let me, let's stop it a second here. So we have three cotangent circles, pairwise tangent circles, OK? And uh, I picked a point up here at the, the north pole of one of the circles. And what we do is we form a straight line going through the point of tangency. And you continue until it hits the opposite wall. And then you go out to the other point of tangency and continue until you hit the wall. And you keep going, right? So um, in this figure, because it's so regular, it's pretty easy to see what's going on. So into the sec second, into the third, back into the first, 
packing. And the, the uh, point is, is that when we complete this thing, let's just look at the final result, uh, we seem to have completed this in six steps. If, if you look at it, it looks like we're ending where we started in six steps. And in fact, the geometry is so easy here, you could prove it. Prove it. I promise you only one proof. But, it, but believe me, it's not hard to prove. Um, so, uh, so the question is, you know, if you take a point that's that's not the North Pole here, you know, that you might consider the zero one. So maybe it has two other rational numbers. What happens to the length of this thing? Does it is it some function of numerator or denominator? Or what kind of mess is it? Or even worse, if you take let's say the rational coordinates, you just keep looping around forever to just fill up everything after a while. Really hard to say. Maybe Boris, Boris don't give you the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so let me tell you how I made that map. How I made that map. So uh, this again was done with asymptote. Um, uh, the reason is is that this path of length six there is uh, obviously something. All, all the pieces are easy to describe in asymptote. And asymptote happens to be a function which says print t. Uh, of t percent of the path, you know, you can you can def define a path which is just a partial path, right? So I mean, this this is not unique to asymptote, but it is an asymptote. So basically, I'm just printing this one path with the length uh, extended. Okay, so that's easy. So okay, so here's the sort of the same thing, but I made it a little less regular, and I I took the east point here instead of the north point, and I went. Oh, okay. So I found another example with six. Okay, so we've got we've got a couple of those, and the question is, how do we resolve these other things? So I'm going to run this little animation for you. It'll give you a hint of what the situation is. So the red thing is going to move around the circle, and we'll watch the figure generate itself. Okay, so you see the red red dot moving along, and the six side. Okay, you know what the theorem is now, right? <laughs> and you're totally convinced what the theorem is, right? So the, this animation is pretty convincing. Um, and and in, f in fact, it's true. Um, uh, uh, I told you only one proof. <laughs> but I'll tell you how to prove this. So uh, I've added something in here. So we have six cycles. So I've joined what are usually called antipodal points. So if you have points one to six, you're going one to four, two to five, three to six. Did I say one to six? Yeah, one to six. Yeah, one to four, three to five, three to six, right? The opposite points. So if this is one, this is three. And so you see, you know, so I've added in these, these antipodal points. And when we start the animation going there, same animation with those in, aha, then, then you really see what's going on. So the first thing that you see that's going on is those antipodal lines are diameters of the circle, right? And so that means you don't have to count to six, you only have to count to three. If you end up on the other side, three more times. Okay, so you cut the problem in half to begin with. Uh, so the question is, how can you do the, the three things? And actually, if you look at this picture, that answer is in there too. Um, because if you stare at those diameters, they're parallel. And once you realize they're parallel, the whole, the whole picture's there. Okay, so the, that's the convincing thing. Um, so, okay, so this, uh, um, yeah, so these were done in, in kind of an interesting way, because um, uh, I did use asymptote for this, um, but asymptote has uh, an interesting command called ship out. I don't know where that name came from. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what it means is you can produce the file and ship them out, and what you'll get is a, is a PDF of one page in each ship out. And the animation loop here says to, to bring in the pages one at a time. From, and that's one of the things you can do with animation. You give it a PDF file of three, each page is one frame, and it runs the whole thing. So that's, that's done at a little higher level of abstraction. OK, one more example. Um, and uh, these uh, have to do with rotations of the plane. So I mean, the first example of linear transformations that you give. 
So here's the story. We're, using, we're looking at the xy plane. We take some vector x in the xy plane. And we have some angle theta. What we're going to do is rotate it counterclockwise to get a new point, which we'll call y or L of x. So the first application of uh, these things is you can say, hey, for any x we can take, we can compute the y by this real simple matrix multiplication, two x matrix multiplication. Um, so it's really, and that works for any point. So it's really nice. It's justified matrix multiplication, right? As a, as a useful thing. Uh, incidentally, when I teach linear algebra, I really try to put a lot of geometry in it because the way I think of it. So I'm the prof and I can do it. So, um, so, so, so here's what I do with this in class. So uh, here's the thing. This is, was done with Tixi. So uh, it's uh, a bunch of single points. I, it's meant to look like a blob of points that are roughly shaped in an ellipse. So, so the point is, as I say, suppose I take an angle theta and I apply it to each point, the whole figure is going to change, right? What happens if I apply a square? Well, A rotates it by the theta, and the second A rotates it by another theta, right? So I tell them, look, we're just going to take A to the K and apply this thing to, to this thing and let it run, right? So I say, OK, let's take A to the K and apply this thing and let it run, and the thing runs like that. All of a sudden, everyone's awake. <laughs> which doesn't, doesn't always happen in lots of places, but it's something it does. Um, and uh, so, oh, that's interesting, that projection. <laughs> that's, the, that's the rubber ellipse thing. It's, uh, no, it's OK here. No? All right. Um, so, uh, uh, so, so we call this the, ro the rotating uh, ellipse thing, uh, the rotating uh, ellipse example. And, uh, and uh, they uh, find it as a really convincing thing. Uh, I usually mention at this point that if you look at the graphics chip and you look at the specifications, the sine and cosine are hard coded into the chip so that you can do these calculations really fast. And here's a reason why. So uh, actually, I, I was substituting in a class once for a colleague, and there, I, it was just at this point. So I brought this thing in. The end of the year, uh, you have to make comments about the course. So my colleague brought a comment. The person said, uh, I'm not really good in mathematics. I'm sorry I didn't do better, but I love that rotating ellipse. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I can get a guy, and this is the last math he's ever going to see in his life, and he said, I like something in that course, I figured that's a plus. OK, so that's, that's the example. This is done in a little bit different way uh, because it's done with no external program at all. It's complete LaTeX code. And the reason is each frame is a pixie picture. Of course, we're doing the animated in line, so you can do frame, frame, frame. And then in, within that, you go to your pixie picture environment, create the frame, do the, do the whole thing as a while do loop in the animated in line, so that all the animated in lines run properly. And the whole thing works. It's really nice. So, uh, so that's another example. Incidentally, the, as I said, there's sort of a meta problem here is that what you're actually looking at is a single PDF file I'm projecting. Um, so uh, uh, it's interesting to know that all these examples that came from all these different things are in one PDF file. OK, so I'll finish off. Uh, let me drop out of here because I want to get away from that tower and, and we'll call it a day. So, OK, so here's the thing we've been viewing here. So let's kill this. OK, and I guess that's a thing. We can kill that. And this actually looks like the operating system, but it's a virtual operating system. So let's see if we can kill that. Let's shut it down. Shut down. OK, that should only take a minute. You know, the nice thing about virtual operating systems is they, they collapse so quickly. <laughs> so, uh -huh. so here we are back in the, oh, and now you all know that it's 21 degrees. And, okay. Uh, so what I want to do, let's open uh, browsers. So obviously, this is Windows, completely different system, completely different setup. Um, so let's open to this, and here's the review of everything we've done. Okay. <laughs> so, so the, all those things that I did, you know, I told you there was the JIT way of doing it too. There they are. Right? So, so uh, yeah, I, I guess there's a little more. You can make them big. Seem to be oh yeah, I know the rotating diameters, and 
Ooh, what's that thing? Oh, yeah. Okay. So there we go. So you see, uh, you can really move from thing to thing. Okay, that's what I have to say. Thanks very much. Uh, so before we go on our 10 minute break only instead of 15 minute break, um, are there any questions for Michael? Yes. And Where did your controls come from on the PDFs and you know, can you get controls easily on the HTML versions? Uh, yeah, well, with the PDFs, uh, obviously there's loads of stuff that I didn't tell you. That's the PD stuff, right? When I, when I was doing these Examples of the animate commands, I left out of all unnecessary, you know, buttons and things. But there's a huge number of parameters you can do, and doing those buttons and doing what color and everything, things that you can set up like that, which I did. Animated gifs, you have almost nothing. All you can do with an animated gif is run it, basically. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so how long? <laughs> the postscript code? Five minutes? I mean, really? What, what do you do with postscript? You, you draw the wall, you draw the floor, you decide how high it is, you, you count, you have, so you have that point, you, you have the floor point, you draw the line, you draw the dot, you draw the yard. I guess that's it, seven, right? So I, That's what postscript's good at. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is really getting down like the similar code, but. but uh, I have a feeling, uh, is there going to be a second question? <laughs> Are you beating me into something? Yeah. <laughs> okay. May a final comment from Boris. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, just one thing which Michael did not tell you, which is important. And the thing is that unfortunately the only way you can run this is in Acrobat Reader, which is free as in beer, but not free as in speech. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, right now free as a speech PDF readers do not support animation. So it took all of us a lot of time and effort to convince Carol that animate still belongs to deadlift instead. By a special dispensation we put it there, but... Uh, no, it's actually because, of, well, somebody can then, somebody showed me the code of, a, of, a experimental, of, a, of an experimental version of, a free, of events, I think. One yes. of the free readers that has animation code in yeah, there. But and I reluctantly said, oh, all right. Yeah, it was very I remember this discussion. So what I'm saying is that it's important that people who do uh, free, as in speech, PDF readers should support animation. Yes. But and yes. it's yes. easy because all the specs are there. You have all the specification, all the standards. Easy is not the word I would use. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my understanding is Adobe Acrobat puts them as layers, takes each frame, makes it as a layer in the picture, and then ripples. Yeah, 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 but, yeah. Okay, if you so have time to read 1,500 okay. pages of specifications, yeah. you know how to do it. Doug really wants to say something, I think, but we'll, we'll continue the discussion.